Hi, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We're going to get started in just a few minutes, but as usual, we want to first kick off with a few different polls here. So if you would be so kind and just respond to each one, that'll only take a second, and then we'll get right into it. Great, so the first poll is up, and this is around kind of what what role? Are you a publisher? Are you a developer? Are you a studio? Are you doing both? So if you would just select one of these here and go ahead and hit submit. And everyone will see the results on this, so hopefully you all find this information helpful. Great. Okay, the first poll is just in. Looks like we got a predominantly developer and studio audience. Fantastic. So we're going to fire up the second poll here in a second. Okay, the second poll should be up, and this is around kind of stage of development, so where are you at? Uh, have you already launched, finished the development here, is that coming soon? So just go ahead and click one of those, and again, the results will show to everyone. And it looks like most folks are still in development. Okay, excellent. So we're going to finish out here with one final poll. And this one is around where are you currently hosting or developing your applications. So are you already in Amazon? Uh, are you doing this in, on traditional hardware in your own facilities or managed hosting? Go ahead and just click on one of those. We'll wrap things up. Okay, and it looks like we have the results on the last one. Uh, it looks like a pretty good mix. So we have about a third running on Amazon and quite a few still on their own infrastructure. Perfect. Okay, well, appreciate everyone participating there. Why don't we go ahead and get started? So again, welcome. Today we're going to focus on launching and scaling your social game in the cloud. I want to first introduce our panel. Uh, this is Josh Fraser speaking. I'm Vice President of Business Development at RightScale. Uh, I'm thrilled this morning to be joined by several folks here from a couple different companies. So first off, we have Jeff Barr. Jeff is the Senior Web Services Evangelist at Amazon Web Services. So Jeff, thanks for joining again. Good to have you on board. And then we're also joined this morning me. by James Phillips, who's the co-founder and SVP of products at Northscale. You're going to hear a lot more about the Northscale, RightScale, and Amazon partnership during this webinar. So some really exciting stuff that we have going on with Northscale. Uh, Dave Welch is here. He's our sales engineer, and he's going to be leading us through the demonstration of the product and the dashboard itself. And then also on this webinar, we have two folks on Q&A. Uh, we have Daniel Howard from the RightScale side and Perry Krug from the Northscale side. What we like to do on these webinars is keep that Q&A going throughout the entire webinar. So if at any point you have questions, uh, please insert those questions at any point in the chat box in your GoToMeeting viewer. We'll answer questions throughout the webinar, and then we also have a lot of time at the end uh, to go through a more thorough Q&A. And then we typically will keep that Q&A uh, chat window uh, on past the hour as well. So for those that want to stick around, uh, feel free, keep firing away questions, and we'll, we'll stick around as long as we possibly can. So with that, let's get started. Um, today's agenda. So we're going to do a, a quick little intro of the market. You know, this is probably uh, old news to most of you, but just to level set the audience, talk a little bit about what we've seen as far as market dynamics. Uh, and then want to introduce the different components here of the solution, which really is around uh, Amazon at the foundation layer, right scale at the management layer, and north scale at the application layer. So give you a brief overview of, of each of the services here, but then spend the bulk of the time actually in the product itself. So we're going to show you what's been done, and we're going to show you some of the best practice architectures that are being used by the leaders uh, in the social gaming industry today. So again, please uh, ask questions at any time. And for those of you that don't know, or if this is your first webinar, all of these webinars are recorded, both audio and video. They're all available at rightscale.com slash webinars, uh, usually about a day after the webinar is completed. Um, so you can go and download it and watch it till your heart's content. So jumping in, so the market, um, this has been, you know, we, we haven't seen a trend like this in quite some time. I think it's safe to say this is one of the hottest industries out there, so I'm sure you all feel the excitement, but 
uh, it continues to blow our mind just the amazing events that transpire here. Um, so we started out with Playfish, you know, a pretty pretty big event uh, getting picked up by Electronic Arts. Uh, but that's, you know, recently we've had the events from Playdom, you know, getting bought by Disney for about $800 million, and then the SoftBank investment in Zynga, which happened not too long ago. So very hot space. We're seeing a lot of the big traditional media companies get into social games and really, really good trends for everyone in this industry. So I'm sure you guys are all feeling that excitement as well. You know, we've been fortunate enough here at RightScale and with our partners, Amazon and, and Northscale, to actually have a tremendous amount of experience dealing with uh, the largest gaming companies out there and all of the top gaming applications on Facebook today. Um, so we've learned a lot from working with these customers about the various different architectures, use cases, kind of what happens. And we've applied a lot of those learnings to the product that you're going to see today uh, in the RightScale dashboard. To give you a little more depth here, specifically on one game in particular, um, most of you are probably familiar with Farmville. Um, this, this continues to be uh, the number one social game on Facebook, so just an amazing story here uh, from Zynga here with the Farmville game. But there's a couple of key learnings out of here. You know, one in particular that we always like to point out is this is a really a new dynamic of deploying an application in the marketplace from the standpoint that things happen extremely fast and at a scale that was often never before imaginable. Um, so specifically with Farmville, you know, they had a growth period uh, when Farmville was on its rise of adding over a million net daily active users every single week for six consecutive weeks. So a lot of folks go into the initial deployment thinking about the total scale that their game may reach, um, but folks often neglect uh, to really focus on how fast things can change and how fast things can, can grow in this new world that we're living in with these massive social network sites and these very internet-connected mobile devices all over the world. So important to note, so it's both the overall scale but also the pace in which things happen. What's emerged through this process is, is really the reference standard for social gaming in the cloud. Uh, it includes a couple different components, but we've taken a lot of the learnings from working with customers like Playfish, uh, like Zynga, and we've applied those into uh, several components around reference architectures on Amazon Web Services, and then also bundling in best-of-breed third-party solutions like Northscale and their Membase solution to deliver to gaming customers a pre-built best practices architecture that's proven in the marketplace today that you can take advantage of very easily and very quickly. And that's really going to be the focus of the demonstration today and what we dive into. But this came out of the learnings from all the companies and the games that you just saw on the previous slides. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Barr to introduce Amazon Web Services. So Jeff, why don't you take us away? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. And I'd like to just take the next uh, five minutes or so to give you a brief introduction to the Amazon Web Services, the, the, the two-thirds of you or so that are, are not already running on AWS. So the idea here is that AWS gives you very flexible, scalable, secure, and cost-effective IT infrastructure um, designed for applications and businesses of all sizes running anywhere in the world. And you get compute power and stored on demand. And you, you pay only for exactly what it is that you, you use. You, you don't have to reserve capacity up front. You don't have to prepay. You don't have to make forecasts to, as to what you're going to need and, and reserve that. And, and all of this is running on, on scalable, reliable, secure infrastructure um, operated by Amazon Web Services uh, using all of what we know and what we've learned running our, our online retail site for, for well over a decade. Next slide. So uh, it plays very, very well in just into some uh, broad-scale industry trends. Uh, you hear about things like software as a service, and so the, the cloud lets you host in a, a very scalable and reliable environment. Um, grid computing, kind of a, a predecessor to the cloud, lets you take advantage of thousands of servers and get as much compute power as you need. Virtualization, certainly a, a key element underneath the cloud, and lets you use virtual machines and have a lot of flexibility for how you you, um, you put your cloud together and launch machines of different sizes and have lots of control over how they're running and where they're running 
And then finally, um, the service-oriented architecture is, uh, to me, very, very key is the fact that every aspect of the AWS cloud is programmable. So yes, we do have command line interfaces and visual tools, but at the base, you can use APIs. You can make web service function calls to learn about the infrastructure, to launch various components, uh, interrogate, uh, allocate, reserve, delete, and so forth. Here's a, a map, and uh, to go through this map fully would, would actually take me about an hour, so let me just give you kind of a, a high-level overview. Uh, this is the, the main components of AWS, and it, it's really important to know that you can pick and choose from these. You don't have to adapt this whole hog and, and take on every one of these services all at once. Uh, successful applications sometimes will start in the, the lower left-hand computer corner with the Elastic Compute Cloud, and then grow up to use other services over time. So there's different ways if you have an existing application to, to bring it into the cloud. Uh, and there's also considerations if you're building an application from scratch, you might want to take advantage of, of many of the, the, the higher level services as well. So underneath everything, we have something we call metering and billing. So we're able to measure your usage of different services and then present you with, with an accurate bill to reflect your actual use of those services. At any point, you can log into your AWS account, and through our portal, you can, you can see dynamic statistics on your actual use of AWS. Identity and access management just pervades all the other services. So we always know who's making the AWS requests, and we have the ability to create multiple users and to use groups uh, for users to have very fine-grained control of permissions of access to different services. Um, at the next level up, we have services for compute, uh, the Elastic Compute Cloud for hosting, um, simple storage service for storing large amounts of data, complemented by import-export for being able to ship us disk drives and have us import large amounts of data, uh, multiple database offerings, including relational database services, or RDS, which is a hosted version of MySQL. Um, Amazon SimpleDB is a, a NoSQL, a non-relational database. And you, you can also run the third-party database of your choice. Uh, Higher-level services for parallel processing, content delivery, messaging, payments, uh, the Amazon Mechanical Turk for your on-demand workforce. And then at the top level, things like Amazon CloudWatch to let you monitor your use of other services. The AWS Management Console is a, a visual browser-based tool you can log in for full control of, of all your AWS resources. Programming toolkits for a number of uh, languages, including Java, PHP, Ruby, Python, and all the .NET languages. And then the, the virtual private cloud to let you connect your existing network over to AWS and have the AWS resources appear as if they were local on your network with a connection achieved via a secure VPN connection. And one more slide. So uh, wrapping up some of the advantages of the AWS cloud, uh, offloads heavy lifting, so you, you get access to massive data centers. You can be very, very flexible. You can use the capacity you need when you need it. Uh, lower costs, uh, two different ways. You, you're eliminating upfront capital expenditures because you're not investing in data centers and servers. Lower uh, usage costs, so your ongoing operational costs and the expenses will be low. And then the pay-as-you-go utility model, so you're only paying for exactly what you use. And then reduce time to market, so you're, you're not going to waste time on configuring data centers. You're going to be able to get your game online and piloted and tested out very, very quickly. And you can focus on what you do best, on designing, building, optimizing, fine-tuning, and monetizing your game. So you're not doing all the kind of low-level grunge work. You're doing the things that really matter to your business. Great. Appreciate it, Jeff. Thanks for the overview. So let's, let's move up the stack a little bit now and focus on where RightScale fits in. And actually, this, uh, this will also address one of the questions that's come in already, which is on which level does RightScale fit in the AWS framework. So what RightScale is, is we're a management system. Uh, it's delivered as a software as a service. Um, we are a software management platform on top of the AWS cloud infrastructure. Um, what that means is that we focus on a whole host of services ranging from getting up and running very quickly. So there's a lot of automation that provide a fast on-ramp to various different Amazon services, but we don't stop there. We also focus on the overall lifecycle management of your application. 
So all of the operational remediation necessary on your servers, dealing with different procedures around user account management and policies and security configurations, kind of everything that you would need to uh, perform on your system and your multi-tier architecture is done automatically using the RightScale platform. Uh, the platform itself is architected to be as open as possible. And that really means two key things. First off is we embrace and support fully all of the innovation that comes from Amazon. So we keep it open. For example, if customers want to use a load balancing solution uh, that exists natively in RightScale, they can. Uh, if they want to use ELB, uh, one of the components extended from Amazon, they can do that as well. Uh, RightScale remains indifferent to that. But the platform also is open to third parties, so specifically ISVs, so ISVs like Northscale, uh, and gives them a way to easily design and configure and publish uh, what we call server templates on the RightScale platform, making it easier for customers to consume and deploy on Amazon Web Services. So you're going to hear more about that in a second. Um, we've been doing this for quite some time. We're actually in our, in our four-year anniversary month here of working with Amazon and supporting uh, customers on the Amazon Cloud. Um, through that, we've launched quite a few servers. Uh, we're, we're approaching our 1.5 millionth server launched on Amazon, so you can look at the counter on rightscale.com. Uh, and RightScale is the management system behind the largest production deployments on Amazon in the world. So a lot of customers you may have heard, on, heard about in the press. Uh, here's just a sampling of a few of our customers here on the slide for you to take a look at. But very wide range of use cases and customer types and lots of experience deploying on Amazon. Uh, I want to focus very briefly on just a few key concepts because you're going to hear these terms when we jump into the demonstration. Um, the first is around the right scale methodology, and that uses what we call server templates. The easiest way to think about server templates is these are definitions of servers as opposed to dealing with static images. These are definitions that will dynamically configure instances on Amazon at boot time and do further runtime configuration. All right, so a different methodology than dealing directly with static images. Uh, right scale deployments are the collection of multiple resources, so using server templates, the collection of multiple resources that are configured and managed as a single system. So systems level management is a very key concept and value proposition of the right scale platform. So it's not just launching single servers, but multi-server, multi-tier architectures with networking, storage, security configurations, all managed as a single system. And right-scale macros are just a simple way to automatically build out a deployment, build out a system. So you'll see us perform these tasks in the dashboard in a few minutes. Um, but finally, and, and transitioning over now to Northscale and their MEM-based product is uh, just yesterday we announced uh, the most recent ISV partnership with RightScale, that is with Northscale, and their MEM-based server templates are available today. Uh, they're in the RightScale library, and these are specifically architected, uh, ready to use on RightScale and Amazon Web Services using this server template methodology that you just heard about. So with that, I want to turn it over to the Northscale team uh, to introduce MEM-based. Thank you very much. So what we're going to talk about today is Membase. It's a, uh, what has been termed in the industry a NoSQL database. Uh, it's simple, fast, and elastic. Most importantly, I think from a social gaming perspective, it fits in very, very well with Amazon, uh, Amazon's web services offering it and RightScale. And we've built uh, a set of server templates that makes it very, very easy to, to get the technology and use it. Um, let me talk a bit about the problem that Membase Solves. If you look at a typical uh, social game and the architecture of that game, you'll have a bunch of clients on the front end perhaps coming in via Flash or some mobile client. Um, usually uh, those, those front end uh, presentation side components will communicate back to uh, an application server farm, usually through a load balancer. Um, historically, it's been very easy, uh, given the relatively stateless nature of these application and web servers, to simply uh, clone them. Uh, one of the things that was talked about earlier was the use of virtualization technology up in Amazon Web Services. And uh, you can literally uh, clone virtual machines um, and, and in the case of Membase or, or in the case of an application server, clone the application server, 
update the load balancer and you've got this ability to elastically scale and even contract the size of that application server tier. Uh, traditionally, it's been far more difficult on the stateful database side where scaling up tends to be um, the mechanism for scaling. If we go to the next slide, which talks about um, the, the economic challenges here as a, a game developer or as a publisher in trying to facilitate scaling um, while keeping costs in check and, uh, and keeping performance constant and high. So at the application tier, uh, the good news about scaling out and this ability to simply clone to grow the cluster is that you've got a, a, a very linear increase in total system costs <clears throat> as you grow that tier to support more users of your game. Uh, simply add another instance or add another server, uh, you know, update the load balancer, and you've, uh, you've grown incrementally. And that incremental growth costs the same every time you add a net new server. So you get this very nice linear increase in aggregate system cost while maintaining system performance almost to infinity. So with, with a service like Amazon Web Services, um, for all practical purposes, uh, infinite capacity and the ability to leverage that capacity using the scaling model. On the database side, using traditional relational database technology, uh, it's a very different set of curves. Things go nonlinear very quickly. On the, uh, on the cost side, typically it costs more on a per MIPS or per resource basis. For larger instances, uh, if you're using physical hardware, it costs much more for uh, complex, highly engineered SMP boxes on a, on a uh, per MIPS basis. And so the, the cost curve, again, goes up and to the right as you scale that particular tier using traditional database approaches. And on the performance side, you actually get uh, an asymptotic approach uh, with nonlinear uh, degradation of overall system performance. At some point, you just can't get a big enough instance or a big enough server to serve more and more users, and eventually the system falls over. Next slide. So if you look at Membase, it is a, a key value database. It is designed explicitly to provide for scaling out. Uh, again, clone to grow. The ability to take uh, an existing instance in a MIM-based cluster at the data layer, clone it, join it back to the cluster, and, and MIM-based will automatically redistribute data, dealing with the statefulness of this layer, layer to, uh, to, to embrace net new members of the cluster, and even to allow you to remove members of the cluster and rebalance data onto the surviving nodes. So you've got this ability to, uh, versus scaling up and, and the economics associated with that, scale in and scale out to match the needs of your game across its life cycle. Next slide. So there are three characteristics um, that, uh, that characterize Membase. The first is that it's a very simple solution. Uh, it's simple to manage, administer, uh, made even simpler through our uh, right scale templates, and it's very simple to develop against. One of the great things about Membase is that it's 100% compatible with Memcached, which is a uh, nearly ubiquitous at this point distributed caching technology that's being used alongside relational database technology to, uh, to, to speed up writes. You can think about, or to speed up reads, I should say. You can think of Membase as Memcached with high performance reads and writes persistence to storage media, replication, high availability, and true elasticity, the ability to scale the cluster uh, by just adding and removing nodes. On the next slide, we talk about uh, the performance implications of Membase. Probably the most important thing about Membase is not that it provides very, very low predictable latency uh, or high throughput, uh, but it is the predictability or the near determinism associated with those performance metrics. One of the most important things in a social game is the ability to give the user a good experience. When I want to buy another sheep, I better be able to get that sheep purchased very, very quickly and have it show up in the game, or I'm going to be disappointed uh, and perhaps move on, hitting, uh, hitting my ability to, to maintain user satisfaction uh, and ultimately revenue. And so what Membase does better than any other solution on the market is provide very, very tight bounds around latency and sustained throughput. Um, if you look at <clears throat> one of our larger customers' deployments, with 2K object sizes representing application or game state, 
they are consistently saying in a 700 node cluster under massive load um, response times to both gets and sets that range between about 400 microseconds and 1.2 milliseconds in the 99th percentile band. So very, very predictable tight band from a latency and a sustained throughput perspective. Next slide. Uh, and so finally, uh, elastic. So I've already touched on this, won't spend a lot more time here, but MIMBASE is a truly elastic system. And again, this sets it apart from many other solutions on the market right now. You do not have to turn off a MIMBASE cluster in order to expand or contract the, uh, the number or the topology of that cluster. You can, under a heavily loaded system, add net new nodes to the cluster, uh, fire off a, a, a rebalance of the cluster, and MIMBASE takes care of redistributing the data while continuing to serve, with predictable latency, uh, requests for the applications on top. No downtime for maintenance uh, and the ability to continue to, uh, to have your game live while you are expanding and contracting. Traditionally, very, very, very difficult to do at a stateful layer like the database, and it's one of the design criteria and requirements of MIMBASE that we deliver. Next slide. And the last slide. So if you, uh, if you look at the curves that we talked about previously, uh, the ability to, uh, you know, or the, the desire to linearize both the, the cost and sustain the performance of the data tier within a social gaming uh, application, MIMBASE delivers. It takes what were previously pretty ugly nonlinear curves and levels, those out, levels them out to, uh, to linear cost increase as you grow to support more users while maintaining, maintaining performance across the scaling lifecycle. That's it on our end. Great. Thanks, James. You know, we had a question come in while you were speaking, and maybe it's good to address now. Uh, do you typically see customers with MEMBASE? Is this something that they're focusing on scaling NoSQL solutions from day one during the development process, or does that come some, somewhat after the fact? And what do you recommend there? So uh, the, the answer is that traditionally there really hasn't been a good solution. Um, so people haven't been able to architect this in from day one. And, and I think that what we're seeing is, an emerging best practice here where the ability to take this technology and bake it in from day one, uh, A, is lower cost um, than using traditional approaches even from server one, and B, obviously provides for scalability. Um, but having said that, with games that are already uh, in, in motion um, and, and already have infrastructure behind them, we've seen a lot of uh, convergence from a memcache D plus MySQL cluster architecture to a membase uh, uh, cluster architecture. So our largest customer was a very large user of memcache D plus MySQL. And the concern they had was, A, managing two distinct uh, types of infrastructure. Uh, they were using MySQL as a key value store of sorts anyway. They were using memcache D as their primary a data store because they needed the performance in a, in a high performance social gaming environment, um, but they also needed the persistence uh, and the manageability that they got through MySQL. So MemBase was a perfect solution, allowing them to turn off um, an entire cluster of MySQL while consolidating um, uh, the functionality into the remaining set of servers that were previously running Memcached and are now running MemBase. Great, appreciate it. And, you know, we also have two other questions that are somewhat related. You know, one around, uh, is this webinar in general just focused on social games? And then also, can, can MemBase be used outside the gaming industry? Um, so, no, what you're seeing today, it's, it's catering towards a lot of the best practices we've seen in the gaming space, but it is absolutely not limited to just social games, all right? These are proven architectures around a lot of scalable web applications, uh, whether it's a game, uh, or not. And then MemBase, as I'm sure Northscale can attest, uh, certainly there are many, many uses outside of the gaming industry as well. Yep. You know, one of the, uh, if you want me to respond to that, one of the things that we're seeing consistently, which actually spans beyond just social gaming, although it actually touches on social gaming, is the ability to do um, high performance um, um, user profiling and the ability to make decisions based on a given user profile in real time in the context of a game or in the context of serving an ad or in the context of making an offer on a, on a website. The ability to get access to a large set of user profile information 
that you can get very, very quickly and make quick decisions on uh, has been useful across many, uh, many application domains, social gaming just one of them. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks, guys. So let's jump back now and jump into the demonstration part here. And what we're going to do here is we're going to take you through what we've seen to be uh, the full life cycle of, of a typical social game. And we're going to take you through each phase of the life cycle and show you in the right scale product itself uh, how we approach addressing the key concerns and issues related to that particular phase. Um, so starting with the concept and development phase, um, as, as most of the audience can attest to based on what we saw in the polls, um, this phase is all about allowing you to focus on your game development efforts. All right? You don't want to have to worry about infrastructure. You want to focus on development, do it at as low a cost as possible, but that when you're ready, that you can very, very rapidly deliver your new game to market and ensure that you're doing it in such a way that you have a stable and production-ready environment. So what we're going to show you in our first demonstration is how the right scale solution will deliver a pre-built system. All right, so remember we talked about those systems, those right scale deployments. Those are pre-built best practice architectures, multi-server, multi-tier configurations using a right scale macro to make it very, very easy to deploy your social game. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave Welch, who's going to take us into the right scale dashboard itself and show us how we build out this uh, best practices architecture. All right, thanks, Josh. So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the social gaming with membase macro to build out that built out that environment that Josh just showed you. At first, it's going to you know prompt me to set a few you know cloud um, cloud parameters. In this case, the security group and SSH key to be set on all the servers. And Dave, for those that aren't aware, security group is. Security Group's uh, Amazon, Amazon's Ingress Firewall. Okay, and you can set up multiple security groups within your environment on multiple tiers, correct? Exactly, and we're just prompting them so you can set this for, this, for that whole environment. Okay. So next it's going to prompt me for the application type. In this case, we're going to want to create a PHP application environment, and then create the, uh, the deployment nickname. In a second, it's going to build out that exact environment. Um, so what, what we're doing here is it's one click to build out that entire kind of concept and development phase of this five, uh, five or six server cluster. So let's see what this built out here, Dave. So we go over to deployments now. So I jump into the gaming, gaming webinar deployment that we just created. And as you can see, we have two load balancers, two PHP app servers, and two Membase DBs. So in the next demo, we'll show you how we can re-architect this to you know, accommodate for scaling out the application and membase tiers. So I think a, a couple key things to note here, and again, thinking back to this server template approach. So by executing this macro, RightScale has built out this pre-configured architecture, this pre-configured system. So this particular system is what we found to be best practices for a very easy and proven way for the initial launch uh, of your social game. Uh, because the Membase solution is now published as a server template, it's very easily added as part of this overall system architecture. None of these servers are running here yet. We're going to show you a running deployment later. But the entire architecture of this system, including things like security parameters, you saw Dave set that security group, have been set up automatically by executing this macro within RightScale. So let's jump back now and take a look at the slides. And what Dave has just built out by executing that macro is the diagram that you see here. So you have redundant load balancers and application <laughs> servers. All right, so that is best practices. Uh, these are deployed in a single region on Amazon. And then you have uh, a Membase master and then the initial replica one server on the database side. So best practice architecture executed saving a lot of time and effort during the initial phase. Moving on now to the production and growth phase. So now you're launching your game. All right? This is all about how do you deal with success. And again, thinking back to uh, the Farmville example we showed you early on uh, with Zynga, when things hit in this space, they hit big and they hit fast. All right? So this is not just about launching servers. This is about the ability to launch and auto-configure and bring those servers into a productive state as part of a system to deliver the needs of your audience 
global as they come and go during various times of the day. So things happen very fast. Automation is key here. Um, so there's a couple things that we're going to take you through next uh, about how we would actually re-architect the environment that Dave just created. So what he created first was that base environment, very easy to develop within. But this environment re-architecture now is going to be how do you set yourselves up to scale and to automate. Okay? The key things here are you know, a fast and successful roll into production. All right? System level automation is also critical. All right, if you're just launching servers and having to throw armies of system administrators at those servers to configure them into a productive state, you're not solving the problem. And also, we see a lot of cases where you need to add multiple different resource pools in multiple different geographic regions on Amazon. Right. So moving into the next demonstration now, Dave's going to show us uh, a couple key things here. First, he's going to show us how to literally re-architect our system. Uh, specifically, we're going to add a couple arrays. And then also he's going to show you some of the reconfiguration you can do on the default settings within the auto scaling parameters on those arrays. So with that, Dave. Thanks. And actually one of the questions just came in was how do I set up this array um, for my deployment? So we initially created that uh, you know, six server cluster. So now let's go ahead and create a, you know, the scalable PHP app server array. So we're, I'm, gonna, we're going to do an initial array first and then in one uh, region of Amazon. So what you're seeing here is Dave is selecting this U.S. East region. Um, just to reiterate from Jeff's earlier comments, Amazon maintains four regions right now. So one in Europe, two in the U.S., one on the East Coast, one on the West Coast, and one in Singapore. So giving you a great opportunity to architect high availability solutions and more performance tuned solutions uh, that are close to where your usage is coming from. Architecting across those regions is made very, very easy uh, using a tool like RightScale. Just wanted to point out that I'm attaching this PHP app server array to the gaming webinar deployment that we previously created. So next we want to set the server options in the cloud configuration. We're going to do that by you know, selecting the server template that we're going to use. In this case, we're going to want to select the PHP app server template. So what this is doing is every single time an application server is launched, it's going to bring itself within context within our uh, gaming webinar deployment. So it's the same server template that's launching these servers over and over again. Over and over again, and they have the exact same type of you know, cloud configuration. This, in, this, in this case, we're using the same SSH key and security group. You know, next, we want to distribute the allocation policy. So we would set our min and max count. And at the same time, we want to distribute, as Josh said, over the multiple zones within AWS. So in this case, we're going to, we're going to set it to any. So it'll distribute over the four zones within the US, the US East region. And next, we're going to set the decision alert to threshold. So when these servers grow, we want the majority of the servers to vote before an action is taken. So I think, Dave, so what, what a couple key things here. One is we're not bundling instances here, right? We haven't created a static image for this machine. This server template is the definition that's going to dynamically provision that machine when that instance boots. And that's how it brings it within context. It knows which load balancer to register, um, so on and so forth. Okay. Now, can we create another array now for, for Membase? Yes, we're going to do it's the exact same procedure. In this case, now we're going to set it up to scale out the Membase tier. And just point out, these are all alert-based, so you can scale it out based on the alerts that you set. So next, I'm going to add it to the gaming webinar. And then we're going through the same procedure. I'm going to select the server template. So in this case, it's North, North Scale, and they just published it to our library. Next, I'm adding the server configuration options to it. So every single time this Membase server is launched, it'll be part of the same group. And the key, the, the key thing that enables that is these server templates uh, contain environment variables called inputs. Okay? And the inputs are shared amongst multiple different server templates within a system. So that's what allows these Membase servers and these application servers that uh, Dave configured earlier to be not only launched, but auto-configured into the productive state as part of a system uh, to address the increased load in this case that, uh, that your game warrants. And as those Membase mem servers come online, you know, the application servers and the other Membase servers are aware of each node that comes on. Okay. So and then I'm going to click Save. And then we'll jump back to the gaming webinar deployment and see the arrays that were attached. 
So as you can see now, it's the same exact environment, but now that we've enabled the scaling of the application tier and also the database tier. So now let's jump back and then we'll, we'll cover the maturity and decline phase. So Dan, I noticed you created both of these uh, arrays in the same region. Now, can we create an array in a different region as well? Yes. Yeah, so at, at first, we're just going to create it in that one region. Um, but as your, as your application is growing, you're going to want to distribute the arrays in multiple Amazon regions, either the U.S. West, the Asia Pacific region, or even the Europe region. And we see that used primarily for performance issues, latency and whatnot? Exactly. Great. Well, thanks, Dave. So let's let's jump back now and take a look at, at what's been done here. Uh, so what you saw Dave do here is take this standard uh, six-server cluster, this six-server deployment within RightScale, and he added not one but two different arrays uh, to this environment. One was around the application tier, and the second was a mem-based tier. So uh, these arrays will grow and shrink horizontally based on any of the automation metrics uh, that you set. Those can be load metrics, those can be attributes of queues. Uh, maybe North Scale team, this is a good, a good time to discuss. What, what typical scaling metrics do you guys see when using Membase? There are two. Um, the first is um, data, uh, data size. Obviously, if you're reaching storage limits um, or if you are exceeding the working set size to RAM ratio that you've set or, or approaching that, Adding more nodes allows you to, uh, to keep the parameters of your cluster in check. And so those would be the two key metrics we'd key off uh, for an automated expansion. Got it. And then uh, one of the advantages of deploying Membase within RightScale on AWS is you can take any metric that is being monitored at a system level and trigger what's known as an alert and an escalation within the RightScale platform. Uh, and those alerts and escalations are what cause the platform to take these automated, automated actions on the user's behalf. Um, so all of this is done automatically. Anything that's being monitored can trigger one of these actions within the platform. So providing tremendous agility and automation when you're dealing with that rapidly changing environment. So next, let's move on to the next phase here, which is around maturity and decline. So. Here's where your game has made it. So you're a success. Congratulations. So you're making money. Um, but like all of these, all of these games, uh, over time they run their course and you start to look at things a little bit differently. Uh, some of the things that we encounter quite a bit here are how do you optimize? Okay. How do you make sure that you're taking best advantage of the resources that are deploying without having to throw a lot of overhead, a lot of personnel overhead at the environment to constantly monitor it? Um, another interesting transition we see in all these gaming customers with these successful games is, you know, the focus becomes more around ROI and security and control. So are these games making money? How much does this environment cost? Who has access to this environment? Kind of, there's now a real business and real revenue behind these games, so the need to control and to provide visibility becomes very, very important. So with that, we're going to turn it over and look at the next uh, demo around the maturity phase. And two key things here that we're going to show you. One is how you would actually do a system. Again, a system is a deployment. So system level consumption tracking and estimates. So show you how you can look at the different trends uh, within each game. And then second, talk a little bit about some of the security parameters around user access, roles, and control. So Dave? <coughs> So in this case, I jumped into one of our accounts that has the gaming production uh, environment running. So we're looking at a running, running deployment now? Well, we're looking at the overview page. And the one thing you know, we want to point out is you get insight into the consumption of each of the deployments. So not only at an account level, but also at a deployment level, so you know how much each of those grouping of servers are costing you uh, the current run rate, you know, the month to date, and the projection. And not only you, see, you can see the prior months, uh, total consumption. And what we typically see, right, is uh, gaming customers will actually isolate environments. So those are just simply right scale accounts, but have isolated accounts for each game. So you can not only separate from a security and performance standpoint, but also from a cost tracking and cost accounting standpoint. You can know per game what that environment is costing you. Exactly. And it's important to break those out and we'll get into an, in a later demo on sharing these assets between the accounts so you're not having to re-architect. So next, let's jump into the game production environment. 
And the one thing I wanted to point out is the user control now. So now that the game's up and running, we need to know what's going on and who's doing what within this environment. So if I jump to the audit entries, everything within the environment is tracked. So you know who's starting up uh, which servers, who's shutting down what, who's, and who's gaining access to these servers at any time. Next, I want to jump to the, you know, the user account. So every action within the RightScale platform is tracked and audited. And also, you can dole out access between multiple accounts with, you know, with one view. So I jump to the, uh, the users page. We can see that Andrew DeMille has access to four different accounts. And it's important to note here that in Studio 1 and Studio 2, he has different access privileges. So in Studio 1, he's able to design, uh, design the components uh, that will later be deployed. And in Studio 2, he's only observer, so he can't take any action. He can only see what's going on within that environment. And we see that quite a bit, right? Because you'll have developers who will work on one game and then move to the next, move to the next, or sometimes even work on more than one project at the same time. And, and you also want to you know, remove some of their access as they move from project to project. Great. And then another key thing to note here is if you want to get down to user level cost accounting tracking, you can do that as well by simply creating this isolated environment, this account uh, within RightScale, and having only a single user be a member of that account. So very, very flexible in terms of how you set this up. Great. Thanks, Dave. So let's, let's jump back now and look at the final phase. So here's a situation now where uh, you've, you've reached end of life. And the key things that we see here are that you've, you've accrued all this tremendous learning around your successful game. So why go back and redo things from scratch? Uh, so what this phase is about is providing users a way to very, very easily share different environments. So share these best practice systems that they've created and proven and fine-tuned around their own applications uh, with the next game and the next game. So creating easy ways to do that. Um, there are also ways that you can automate around the various different automation within RightScale to maintain specific SLAs. Um, we see SLAs around number of users. We sell SLAs around you know, specific uh, rendering times of videos in certain cases. Uh, it really runs the gamut in terms of what you can trigger this automation on. And then finally, we do see customers that are looking to actually split their environment and start to take advantage of resource pools that may be in-house in creating a hybrid cloud solution. So with that, we're going to look at uh, the final demo here. And what Dave's going to do is show us, uh, show us a common use case around end of life, which is how you go about cloning a system and then sharing it with the next group. And the, the common things we see here is both within a larger organization where you have multiple different project teams that want to take advantage of that best practices environment, um, we see them cloning these systems and then publishing them out. But it also is very, very common for studios and publishers to use this tool as a way to interact, create isolation, and then easily roll into production uh, when they're done. Because even though these may be independent companies, uh, Dave's going to show you, you can create isolated environments, pre-built architectures on the cloud where a studio can develop against. And when ready, the publisher can simply change the credentials and access privileges and roll that into production. So with that, Dave, why don't you take us through those pieces. Sure. Thanks, Josh. So as you can see, I'm in this game production account that's currently running. So the first thing I'm going to show is how to clone this environment. So this can be used to deploy a new game or to be used to create a new staging environment. So within RideScale, all I have to do is click the clone button. And what it's doing is it's taking the templates and all the kind of the, the metadata configuration for the deployment and copying over. So in a second here, you'll see all the servers in an offline state. So this is taking not only the server configuration, but also the networking configurations, the storage, replication cycles, all of that uh, is configured within these server templates, and now you're cloning the whole system, right? That's, it. That's exactly right. Okay. And now in order to relaunch this, you'll want to change a few inputs around. So for example, you know, the code branch to deploy your new game or to create a staging environment. Okay, so it's all component driven, and now that it's at a definition level, at the server template level, I can go in and change a single variable if I wanted to, uh, and then relaunch this deployment. 
and that's the beauty of the server template. So it allows for um, you to re easily recreate your environment based on changing a few environment variables. Next, let's jump, jump back into the game production account where we initially created um, you know, the, the gaming webinar deployment and added the two arrays. So what I want to show you here is how to macro that up so you can now deploy it or share it with another account so that they can, re, so that they can execute the macro and rebuild that environment so you, you, know, you, you, you reuse those best practices. So what I'm going to do here is I'm creating a macro out of the deployment that we created during the demo. And in a second here, it's going to build out all the code, and then I'll have the ability to publish this to the library. And the use case here is I want to share it privately, and I want to share this architecture with multiple studios. So now it's asking me who I want to share it with. So in this case, you know, I just want to select the game studios, and these are account groups. So the game studios could be multiple accounts or multiple game studios that I'm sharing it with. Next, I'm, I'm going to set the descriptions for what I'm actually sharing with them. So I'm going to go ahead and just copy this for the sake of the demo. And I'm going to add in the notes so they know what I added to this environment. Next, we want to preview what we're sharing. So once we're satisfied, we're able to publish this out to multiple accounts. And those studios will, will be able to go into their library and view this newly published macro and rebuild their environment. Like it, it's worth noting here that you as the publisher, you maintain complete control over that system's definitions, correct? You, may, you remain complete control. You have the ability to deprecate it or notify them of new changes. And then the way you allow users to interact with it then is you could invite them to these accounts and invite them with specific roles and permission levels that would enable them to add to this architecture or potentially make changes. Yes, exactly. So it's not only at our deploying or sharing it with the studios, but even with your development groups and your testing groups as it's split over multiple uh, Amazon accounts. Excellent. So we, we, we've taken a snapshot now. We've cloned a system, a production system, and then we've easily now shared it out. So we've kind of codified best practices, if you will, and shared that out with other isolated environments, which could be internal within your organization, or it could be uh, third-party studios that are contracting on your behalf. So very, very flexible environment in that regards. So a question just came up. Um, can you charge for these publications like paid AMIs, or is it always free for others to use it? Charge for these publications. So uh, a couple of things on that, and we'll get in. There are a few other questions on economics in general, so why don't we tackle those right now. Um, so within RightScale, you can access and launch and run any of the uh, publicly available AMIs. Uh, of course, if you want to create your own AMIs, those will be available as well. If those are registered dev pay paid AMIs, uh, they're fully supported as well. Um, the bill that you get from Amazon will be representative of that. Um, a lot of the server templates within RightScale and the various definitions are completely free. So when you go into the RightScale libraries, uh, it'll note on that specific server template whether that is a free template or a for-pay template. Uh, but while we're on the subject of costs, uh, a couple other questions we had here. So, uh, Jeff, actually, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. Um, we had a question from uh, what they described as an independent small company and costs as an issue and what are the prices for launching within AWS. So maybe if you would please just a little bit about the pricing model within Amazon would be great. Sure. So this, this is a good question, and I, I think this highlights the, the pay-as-you-go model and uh, the value of it. So your, your first EC2 server that you could launch, you, you could choose to launch our, our smallest instance size, which is called a micro, and you can launch those for, for two cents, two pennies per hour. And uh, we, we have a full range of instance types. We currently have, I believe, 11 different instance types that go from pennies per hour up until multiple dollars per hour that have various amounts of CPU power, RAM, and, and local disk space. And then uh, there's also different amounts of uh, networking bandwidth allocated to those instance sizes based on their price as well. Great. So, Jeff, it sounds like the minimum commits an hour, huh? 
a couple pennies per hour to get you started. <laughs> gotcha. So kind of mo moving up the stack there in the economics, um, you know, RightScale is delivered as software as a service. Uh, so you do pay a baseline subscription, so very similar to how Salesforce would charge. You're paying for a specific subscription. And then like Amazon, it's pay-as-you-go uh, usage-based. Um, there was a question here about overall economics, and instead of getting into detail in the interest of time, um, I'll refer you to a white paper on TCO, Total Cost of Ownership, uh, that was written and published. It's available at rightscale.com. Just go to the white paper section. And the white paper is focused entirely on how to think about cloud economics. It, it is a little bit different. You know, you have both the hardware component, the associated overhead costs, power, and whatnot, uh, but then more importantly, business agility. So I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, there was also a question in here, again, cost related around spot instances um, and reserve instances. So maybe, uh, Jeff, while we're queuing up the example in the dashboard, maybe if you would please just quickly talk about what reserve instances and spot instances are. Sure. So um, th these are kind of specialized pricing models and usage models. Uh, the the basic pricing that we talked about is called the on-demand pricing. If you have uh, the ability to basically understand your usage for a, a one or a three year period and you want to to get a, a lower per hour price, we offer something called a reserved instance where you, you can purchase the reserved instance for a one year or three year term. After you've done so, you are then able to run at a much lower hourly rate. That if you run at 100% uh, of the time, you're basically a little bit uh, past 50% discount on the, the effective cost per hour when you take that initial payment into account. So that, that's if you have very, very predictable usage. And, and the, the way the system is set up, it, it, will, it will first charge you based on your reserve pricing and then anything that isn't covered by reserve pricing, you'll pay on-demand prices. So you don't have to worry about running on-demand versus running reserved. We'll, we'll, we'll take care to bill you at the lowest possible price. Uh, the spot market is basically you submit a bid for some compute power, and you tell us what you'd like to run and what kind of machine you'd like to run it on and where to run, and you tell us the maximum amount you're willing to pay for that. And then at any given point when we're able to provide you CPU power at that price, we'll launch your machine image and let it run as long as your bid is sufficient to cover any, any uh, price increase within the spot market. So this is great for background processing or optional processing where you can basically set a value for it and then you're, you're not concerned about the exact time when it starts to run. Great, thanks Jeff. And, and like all things that Amazon releases, they're fully supported within RightScale. So while Jeff was talking, we just pulled up the instance page here. And you can see you can select between uh, both the on-demand as well as the spots. And then you can also reserve instances uh, through RightScale as well. Um, so why don't we move off of costs, and I'm going to kick it over now, another question, kick it over to uh, the NorthScale team. Uh, the, the question in general was I'd like to know more about persistent connections uh, and kind of the implications when you scale. So if you would, guys, maybe talk a little bit about that. Sure. One of the, um, so I'll, I'll be really specific and, and then hopefully gen, uh, generality can be inferred from what I say. So in a PHP environment, uh, which is very typical for a lot of these social games on the application tier, one of the challenges uh, is dealing with uh, connections. Uh, you've got processes that are coming and going uh, rapidly. And so with Membase, um, one, of the, one of the things that we built into the overarching system is a, uh, a client side uh, component that holds persistent connections with the Membase cluster uh, and, and allows you to pull those and, and assign those to PHP instances as they, uh, as they live and die. And so uh, connection pooling and, and the maintenance of persistent uh, connections is a, is a critically important part certainly of a PHP architecture, uh, less so for other environments, uh, and it's something that Membase supports out of the box. Great, appreciate it, guys. Um, another question here, and, and before we get there, we are at the Q&A section, so we'll keep going here. Just as a reminder, we'll keep going here for as long as the questions come in, so keep firing away. We'll stick along, stick around as long as we can. Um, before we get to the next question, though, just wanted to call your attention to uh, the turnkey gaming solution that we have created here with Amazon Web Services and NorthScale. Um, so this is available today. You can get it through RightScale. What it does is package together a lot of what you've seen here on today's webinar. So it's taking advantage of these pre-built systems, these pre-built architectures that incorporate multi-tier, multi-server, 
the Membase server templates that were just published yesterday. All that is rolled up in a very easy and quick to get started uh, solution pack on RightScale. Um, so while we keep diving into more questions here, we'll just leave this screen up. Uh, so just various different references that you could take advantage of. Uh, but let's dive in now to the next question. So uh, Dave, I'll, I'll, I'll throw this one to you. So the question is around what kinds of controls exist in order to prevent auto scaling from getting out of control and launching servers due to an error instead of actual demand needs? Sure. There are, so there are multiple controls that you can use. So the first is the limit, um, the min and max limits. So actually, I'll bring over the dashboard so I can show you this visually. So what I want to show you is that you can set the min and max within your array. So in this case, for our demo purposes, um, the max will never exceed six. But when you're using a larger, when you're in a larger environment, your max will be way, um, much, much higher. But to, to prevent it from um, servers from spinning out of control, you set alerts on each server. And then you have this decision threshold. So it's at, set at 51%. Now what that means is, is that the majority of the servers need to vote. So in this case, we currently have a voting pool of two servers. Now in order for us to take an action, both of the servers have to agree on that action, either to shrink or to grow. So when they agree to grow, a new server will then be provisioned and the next time around, you'll need two of the three servers um, to agree on that vote before an action is taken. I think just a key point of clarification, all servers are voting, but a majority here have to agree with whatever action you're about to take for that action to take place. Exactly. Yeah. And, th and then the last thing I want to point out is this resize calm time. So we allow you know, five minutes before we take another action. Now this is used to prevent you know, the servers from continually voting on the same thing, so it allows the, the new, newly provisioned server to come online before another action is taken. Thanks, Dave. And then one other point on, on automation around scaling is that we see quite often in the social gaming space is this resize up by and resize down by. So what this does is it's changing the resizing uh, amounts, whether you're scaling up or scaling down. So if you want to take what is very common, if you want to take a conservative approach, and make sure that you're provisioning enough resources for continued demand, you can resize up by, let's say, uh, 10 servers each time you vote to grow, but then only take away five on the way down. So just as added security, uh, excuse me, added assurance that your environment needs are going to be substantial enough for the demand, uh, you can change the resizing. So another question just came in that's related, related to the topic of auto scaling in this what is the server voting on? So what is it based off of? Well, it's based off whatever the user wants to configure it as. So RightScale provides some default alerts, but you can set any, any type of alert. An alert contains a condition for a certain duration and then a set of actions. So let's go ahead and jump to one of the servers so I can show you the alerting mechanism. So in case of the front ends, it's voting on the CPU idle value. So if this condition is satisfied for a certain duration, then let's escalate to vote, uh, place a vote in to grow these servers. And so as mentioned earlier there, uh, these alerts can be set on any of the monitoring metrics uh, at a system level. So some of the more popular metrics uh, that you'd scale your membase uh, tier on can be used to trigger alerts and escalations uh, that you're seeing here that would automatically launch servers, terminate servers, and then provision those servers into a productive system. Um, everything that Dave's showing you, just to reiterate, is entirely configurable by you, the user. So when you get started, you'll get set up with some best practice defaults, but you are free to do any fine tuning that you wish, uh, and we're happy to make recommendations based on your specific needs. Appreciate it, Dave. Thanks. So, uh, Jeff, I'll, another one for you here. Um, just general guidance on uh, bandwidth per instance, kind of what you've seen, different sizes, uh, instance sizes and whatnot. If you can touch upon that, that would be great. Okay. So we don't publish specific numbers about the amount of bandwidth that's allocated, but we, we do our best to make sure that there's, there's adequate bandwidth to each different instance. Uh, as a general rule, the, the larger the instance type, the, the less um, other machines on, or less other instances on the same machine you'll be sharing with, so the, the better bandwidth you'll be able to achieve. And then at the high end, we do have an instance type called the cluster compute instance. And with the cluster compute instance, 
you can create a, an object called a placement group. You can then launch clusters, instances inside the placement group. And those instances will enjoy uh, 10 gigabit uh, non-blocking bandwidth between the instances. So if you need something that has the, the need to, to talk be between the, the nodes at very, very uh, high speed with, with nothing in the way whatsoever, then uh, the cluster instances are one great option. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so Northscale team and kind of on general uh, the subject of different instance types, um, do you, have you experienced any insight or any recommendations on different thresholds of when you'd move up instances? What do you typically see customers deploy on initially as far as instance sizes? Any insight there you can share? So, I, you know, I hate to give the, uh, the obvious answer, which is it depends. Um, <laughs> but, but, you know, ultimately the decision as to which types of instances and how many of them you use is going to be somewhat application specific and, and we can give good guidance on how you think about balancing um, memory, CPU, disk, and network bandwidth in order to, uh, to construct a cluster that's going to be ideal for a given um, uh, application load. Um, one of the things that we attempt to do with Membase is to try and keep um, <clears throat> uh, the working set of a given social game in RAM as much as possible. And so memory size tends to be something that we're going to want to focus on, um, ensuring that you're able to serve up, uh, you know, the again, the working set, the live active uh, set of, of users that are hitting your game at any one point in time. You want to be able to migrate that full set up into memory. Um, you also want to have enough disk capacity sitting behind that so that as things age out and as sessions expire, as users go offline or stop playing, things will migrate out of that more expensive uh, component. Network latency tends to be a, um, a big component of, uh, of, of these architectures. So ensuring that you've got um, you know, good network connectivity and, uh, and that you're able to, uh, to bake that into the equation is also something else to think about. It turns out that CPU utilization uh, tends to be the, the, the lower requirement here. So low CPU, balanced memory to working set size, enough uh, disk storage behind it to back uh, all sessions, even those that are hibernated, uh, and then focus on trying to spread bandwidth out across a number of nodes in the cluster is the way to think about what you might be using. But it's, it's hard to be prescriptive without understanding the exact gaming workload. Great. Appreciate it. So uh, while you have the floor here, another one came in. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what kind of deduplication is provided by Membase? Is it at the block level, object level? So um, Membase is, uh, is at its core today a key value store. And so the, the set of um, key, uh, key value pairs or, or key object pairs that live inside of Membase uh, is, is, is sort of automatically deduped, I guess, if you will. If you, if you do a mutation to a given object, uh, at a given uh, key location, um, you're going to simply update that particular object in the system. And so, um, but one thing that we do talk about that is, is fairly unique uh, is the ability to, uh, to um, configure Membase to only do persistent writes um, to, uh, on data that has, uh, that has been updated uh, after some uh, given threshold. And what I mean by that is this. In some gaming environments, you may have a very, very active user that's making a, a change, a change, a change, a change, and all those changes are being sent as mutations into the Membase cluster. Um, we're able to configure Membase so that it will only actually do the disk write or the persistence after a period of settling or after a max period if things don't settle. So you've got the ability to basically dedupe the amount of disk writing you're doing uh, at any given uh, point in time. Obviously, you're trading off their durability uh, for performance. Um, one of the ways that we mitigate that is through replication. So we protect against single node failures in what turns out to be an incredibly highly available environment at AWS by replicating off any particular uh, node a, a configurable number of times. So um, that's, uh, I, I think that sort of covers that one. Yeah, I appreciate it. And, and similar, similar theme here, so a little bit more on what happens when a server dies. So another question came in on, to that effect. So when a server dies uh, in a MEM-based cluster, you're able to uh, fail over and begin serving the subset of the key space that was primarily resident on that dead server 
off of one of the replica servers that holds replica copies of the key value pairs. Membase is a configurable replicated key value store. So you're able to um, configure the, the number of replica copies that you want to have uh, of any given data item within the cluster. You can set it at zero, uh, up to an unlimited number of replicas. Most people typically run with two. Um, so when a server node fails, your data is still available elsewhere in the cluster. There's an automatic failover mechanism that you can use to, uh, to ensure that the, uh, the key space is always available. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so let's move on now. So another question, which is, you know, why wouldn't you enable scaling from the start? Well, the answer is you would. <laughs> so the, the, the key thing here, and hopefully this helps to, to roll some of these themes together, is that by architecting it this way, specifically using server templates and deployments, um, you have the ability to get started in a simple and low-cost fashion, right? So you don't need to overbuild and create a bunch of running instances, right? So that's why you started with that very simple, quick-to-deploy, six-server cluster. You can even go smaller than that if you want to. That's certainly, that's certainly very, uh, very feasible as well. But the beauty now, because you're not bundling images and you're dealing at this server template or this layer of abstraction above the underlying AMI, is that you can very easily re-architect that system. Um, so what you saw Dave do during the demo is add not one but two different arrays to that system. He could have just as easily added six additional arrays, uh, additional fixed servers to his cluster, or whatever else needed to be done, because everything is done at a definition level using server templates. And because these invariables are shared across multiple different server templates, you can easily bring servers in and out of that system in context. Um, so a lot of flexibility there. Uh, next question, and I'll turn it over to, uh, to Dave to tackle this one, which is, and, and this one's great, I like this a lot, which is, you know, we've, we've learned a lot about scaling out on demand under pressure, but, you know, how would you make changes to an environment or an application that's already running uh, without downtime? So maybe talk a little bit about runtime configuration. Sure. So at RightScale, we talk about, you know, managing systems of uh, systems and not servers. So with the right scale dashboard, you have the ability at a deployment level, and I'll go ahead and bring over the dashboard to show you this. So, so at a script level, you can run scripts across a single server. But at a deployment level, we have the ability to run scripts across our entire cluster. So you can run these scripts operationally. So by going to the scripts tab, you go and execute a script, and then it'll ask you, which servers do you want to run this on? And secondly, in one of the previous demos, we were able to clone the, clone the systems. So you're either able to operationally execute scripts or clone environments and make sure it's, it's tested correctly before you bring that over into production. And also these, uh, another key thing to note here, and again, tying back to instances, is these server templates are able to run and take advantage of not one, but multiple different instance types. So we do see quite often, particularly in uh, vertical scaling situations, where a customer would migrate from a small instance type on Amazon uh, up to an extra large or sometimes a, a 4XL instance. And the beauty is they're all uh, taking advantage of a single server template. So the same approach and design methodology can be used to deploy and configure on multiple different instance types. So RightScale is taking a lot of the heavy lifting off of the table for the customer and allowing you to do it automatically uh, with server templates. So next question is, um, so we showed the demo using PHP, so how about uh, Java or another application uh, environment? Is that supported, Dave? That is supported. So if you were to look into the RightScale library, there's a whole host of uh, templates that you can use right out of the box. Um, so some of the examples are you know, the ones that we use are PHP, um, Rails, or their Java Tomcat templates. So you can import that into your account and then customize those templates to fit your application needs. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, and I think just it's worth reiterating here that RightScale is about the automation and architecting uh, server resources on Amazon. So you control your application. Uh, you can deploy any application that you want within RightScale. There are no limitations there. Um, so Dave, appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so we had another question related to that, multiple types of application servers. Can we deploy that in a single environment? 
So you, you know, this is going around along the same theme here. You can architect those deployments with many different types of application servers, and you're managing that system at a deployment level. And then a question on .NET. So yes, same thing. Um, just a, another note on kind of the availability of what you can do with these server templates in various different instance types. Um, so the instance types and the AMIs, so the underlying machine image, WrightScale has tools that you can take advantage of that either use r base AMIs, so r base images, which are called write images. You can also create your own using an image builder tool that we provide. And finally, you can take uh, any publicly available AMI out of Amazon's catalog and WrightScale enable them uh, to be under active management within our platform, and that's using a tool called WriteLink. So all that is available and very, very flexible. So Jeff, uh, another one for you here. So how well would AWS work for an independent game developer? Uh, are there any independent developers that are currently using AWS? Um, well, I'm not quite sure what makes one uh, independent or not, but I, I really think that uh, any game, whether you've got a, 100 users or 100 million users, is, is going to find itself at home on AWS. And to, to me, one of the really cool things about the, this whole highly scalable model is the fact that you can you can build up a model such that you're you're actually profitable based on your your costs versus your revenues at, at that very very low level of usage, and then as your usage scales up, your your cost and your revenue will uh, will go up linearly, and so you you can once you figure out that that key model to make it so that your your game actually draws in the right kind of users and they're they're doing whatever you'd like to to uh, to uh, essentially you know pay you in whatever way that that works. you you can scale the model as, as large as you want and just keep pouring more more tech resources and more traffic generating resources into it and just keep uh, cranking out the money. <laughs> I like it. I like it. So uh, kind of extending that theme here. As, as a smaller developer launching a social game on AWS, does WrightScale make sense to begin with, both in terms of usage and economics, or only after attaining larger user growth and required scaling? Um, absolutely, WrightScale makes sense out of the gate. Uh, so we have various different package offers all the way down to free. Um, so there's, there's two things to note here. Um, one is the difference in methodologies. So when you're architecting your deployment, out of the gate using server templates. You are setting yourself up to take advantage of proven best practice approaches and architectures for a successful game. Right? So you can do that using our free accounts and get access to the server templates and start architecting uh, in the best practices way. Uh, but then as your game does become successful and you are able to sustain uh, more advanced functionality and do require uh, one of the premium additions, just like you can move up in Amazon at any time, it's also very seamless to move up within WrightScale. Um, so absolutely out of the gate, it makes sense, and we encourage customers to do that. Also, finally, to note on that, uh, the mem-based server templates that have just been published are also free. Um, so there's really no reason not out of the gate to start taking advantage of this architecture that you saw today. Here's another question. Could all these solutions be used for a social network website? So the short answer is yes, you know, WriteScale, MemBase, AWS, they're all um, just, you know, WriteScale is a way to manage your cloud infrastructure. So it's just tools to manage any type of application that you're deploying on the cloud. So again, on costs, uh, are there any statistics on how much it costs? Um, well, as, as Jeff kind of mentioned earlier on, on some other issues there, it, it really depends on your game and how successful it is and how many users and whatnot. Um, so that's a tough, tough question to give a blanket answer to. Uh, there are some tools out there that you can get a better sense of what you would likely be looking at as far as cost goes. Uh, Amazon has a calculator for the raw Amazon services, and WrightScale very soon is going to be releasing uh, a calculator as well to help you uh, evaluate both the WrightScale uh, plus Amazon costs. So. Uh, certainly check back, and that will be out very, very soon. So it does depend. Um, we're also more than happy to engage with you to help better understand you know, what you're likely to be looking at. So I appreciate all the questions here. This has been great. Um, why don't we take maybe a few more here. Um, so Dave, I'll kick this one back to you. So uh, how hard is it to update the actual scripts So within a server template? Sure. So 
I'll bring over the dashboard again just to show you. So all the scripts are provided at source form. So the templates that um, you're able to import to, to use for your, at your own disposal can be cloned and customized. So you can customize uh, the, the right scale provided source code. You can add scripts to the template itself. So if I jump into this you know, HTTP perf auto scaling server, which is sending load to our two servers to enable the auto scaling, we can see under the scripts tab that we're able to, if I open it up, So these are just basic bash scripts. So in this, this case, it was just a simple of installing HTTP perf, but there are other scripts like ins um, installing the packages, um, bringing down your um, uh, application code, so they can all be scripted out and modified. Great. Thanks, Dave. And I, I think here also, this is a recurring theme within the platform, is we keep things as open as we possibly can. Um, so you can take the work that's been pre-configured within these server templates by either RightScale's own engineering efforts or partners like Northscale. Um, but once you import that template into your library, you're free to make any additions or changes that you like. Uh, so it's a very open architecture in that regards. Um, another one for the Northscale team, uh, this is around uh, key values. So how does key, excuse me, how does key value based databases like Membase handle the relationships that traditional SQL and relational DBs provide? Sure. Hi, guys. This is Perry Krug. Uh, I'm the uh, system engineer and one of the customer uh, technical support uh, engineers for, for Northscale. I'll field this one. Um, so in, in a traditional environment, we are dealing very heavily with non-relational data. Um, these, these, relational data these non-relational databases um, have come out of uh, lots of, of work to try to get the traditional relational databases to perform um, and, and scale. Uh, for these for these data sets they're working at, and when you're looking at things, uh, it really comes down to the fact that the data uh, is is not relational, um, and the the minor or the small amounts of relationality that is needed um, are typically done at the application level, uh, where the uh, where the code and the and the developers can make decisions uh, more flexibly um, and and more effectively than uh, what a traditional relational database provides. Appreciate that, Perry. Great. Uh, so it looks like a couple more here. So one is around once the game is created, who manages all the server needs? Uh, well, that's entirely up to the administrator on the account. So the beauty here is, you know, thinking back to what Dave showed us within the permissionings and account settings, at any time the administrator within RightScale can change the various roles and permissions that any given user will have on a specific account. Um, so we do see this quite often. Uh, we see this as developers or sysadmins move from project team to project team. We see this often when employees will go and leave uh, a company uh, to start their own. That, that tends to happen sometimes in the gaming community. So they'll branch off and start on their own development initiatives. Um, so that flexibility is very, very key and can happen at any time uh, in a running environment. So you're managing at an account level within RightScale. So think of these environments as virtual data centers. Uh, and you're managing uh, by isolated virtual data center environments and who you allow access to and what you allow them to do is entirely up to you as the admin. Uh, another question around um, instances, specifically AWS initially limits the number of instances that can be started up. Um, so yes, this, this is correct. The default limit is 20. Um, however, that default limit uh, can be lifted by using RightScale. So when you're going through the RightScale platform, uh, we have a very, very tight relationship with Amazon and there's no instance limit, limit limitations that you need to worry about. Um, you can also submit directly a request to Amazon uh, to have that instance limit uh, raised. And we turn those around very, very quickly. They do. We can attest to that. <laughs> Well, with that, uh, maybe we'll wrap things up here. We did have a few other questions that were a bit more specific um, and a little bit off of the, the social gaming topic. Um, so one around business intelligence. Um, so we'll address those uh, post-webinar. Uh, so we'll follow up uh, directly with the users that ask those questions. Um, but with that, I want to, one, thank everyone for sticking around and really, really appreciate all the great, great questions. So hopefully everyone found that Q&A. Uh, very, very helpful. Um, 
there is a resource page that's been left up here, so there's lots of things available. Um, the first thing to note is it's very, very easy and low cost to get started. So all you need is to sign up for Amazon, and again, that's a pay by the hour, so the minimum commitment is literally a few cents. Uh, once you get your Amazon credentials, just go to the right skill uh, login page, and it'll take you through the process of how to enter your Amazon credentials. Uh, once you've Amazon entered your Amazon credentials, you have a free right skill account, and you're off to the races. Uh, and then once you have that set up, you'll get access to the right skill libraries where you can get uh, the North Scale Memday server templates that were just published yesterday. Um, we also have a variety of different content related to gaming. Um, there is a screencast, uh, so it's about 10 minutes long, just goes through the basics. Um, we have two different gaming white papers that we really, really encourage you all to read. Uh, one is published right now, and that's around uh, the business aspects of gaming in the cloud, so how to think about economics and other business-related issues. And then we'll be publishing this week uh, the technical white paper on best practices for gaming architectures. Um, so that's in the final stages of, of release, and that will be published this week. So two different white papers specifically focused on gaming. Um, there's a bunch of use cases up there. And then also any of you that will be in the Bay Area first week of November or feel like traveling there, uh, there's the Right Scale User Conference. This will be our third Right Scale User Conference we put on. It's in conjunction with Syscon's Cloud Expo. Uh, it's on November 3rd. Uh, and we encourage anyone who's around to please attend. Uh, you can register uh, online at rightscale.com. Uh, there'll be lots of customer testimonials. There'll be lots of breakout sessions. We'll have several of our architects and our CTO on hand to take you through uh, more of the specifics of deploying in the cloud. It's a very, very technical and content-rich um, user meetup. So we like to focus on you know, the realities of what we're seeing in the cloud to date. Uh, and then we wrap up the evening with a nice, fun uh, cocktail party. So hope anyone that's in the area can join us. Uh, and then finally, white scale, excuse me, North Scale also has a white paper. We encourage you to take advantage of that. Uh, so the URL is there. And feel free to contact uh, any one of us, so Amazon, Right Scale, or North Scale directly. We work very closely with one another. We're more than happy to engage and chat with you on, on your needs as you think about uh, getting ready to deploy in the cloud. So thanks again for listening. Give us about 24 hours, and we'll have the audio and the video of this webinar up online. Just go to rightscale.com slash webinars. Um, but appreciate everyone sticking with us today. Have a great day, and enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks.